Hi everyone, I'm Candida, co-creator of The Vov. And on behalf of the entire team, welcome to the first event in the Vov Unite series. This week, we have launched The Vov and we are so excited to present our founding 15 arts institutions united in one digital virtual ecosystem in an unprecedented act of solidarity as we embark on this new journey into the digital era where the physical and the digital coexist closer than ever, forever. Here, we will experience the revival of seminal exhibitions from the archives, revisiting these shows virtually for the first time since their original showcase. So enjoy the Vov, all it has to offer from the comfort of your sofa in your own time, which also is the moment for me to invite you to donate what you can to the Vov with all raised funds equally shared between the participating institutions to raise money for the art sector during this time and far beyond. The link to donate will be posted in the chat. Alongside season one, we are hosting a series of exciting events called The Vov Unites, which aims to complement the fantastic exhibitions which we are spotlighting. We hope these events will open conversations with a variety of different sectors and introduce new perspectives. A founding principle of the Vov is to provide a platform for people from all around the world to unite through art and culture. The Vov Unite series will take this a step further by exploring some of the many factors that unite different contemporary industries. Geographical, historical and economic factors mean that many sectors remain inaccessible for much of the world. And whilst the Vov seeks to help solving this problem with the arts, it is a challenge that many other industries are also facing. The Vov Unites wants to connect, helping to promote and allow greater accessibilities for all together. In celebration of World Earth Day 2021, today's events bring together eminent representatives from botanical gardens around the world to provide their perspective on the growing use of these nature museums as places for art and exhibitions. Welcome to Emma Nicholson, have a creative programs with Royal Botanical Gardens, Edinburgh, Scotland. Jennifer Rominiecki, President and CEO of the Mary Selby Botanical Gardens, Sarasota, Florida. Michelle Conklin, Executive Director of the Tucson Botanical Gardens, Arizona. And our lovely moderator, Hannah Rendell, Executive Director of the Botanical Gardens, Jerusalem. Welcome also to two pioneering voices within the world of arts and ecology. Lucia Petroliusi, Curator and General Ecology Curator. Serpentine Galleries, London, UK. Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg, artist specializing on the links between nature and technology. As ever, there will be time for questions at the end. So please do pop these into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. And we will get through as many as we can at the end of this conversation. Before handing over to our lovely Hannah, the moderator for today, I would just very quickly like to tell you about my very personal experience with a work of art that I saw in the context of last year's Back to Nature exhibition in the Botanical Gardens in Jerusalem that has literally changed my everyday life's experience. I have recently moved to Tel Aviv, and as you can see in the image that has popped up on our screens, the city is full of these water meters, fully exposed. I used to get very irritated, as I would see many of them leaking, carelessly placed on the sidewalks, rusting away. But then I discovered in the Botanical Gardens Jerusalem the mesmerizing water fountain by artist Sigalit Landau, beautifully placed in the context of the botanical garden, as you can spot here on the right. Part of a fantastic exhibition among 16 works of art. Since that moment, the whole of Tel Aviv is full of sculpture for me. I photograph them wherever I see them. 
and I look for them. And I know that it was Sigalit's beautiful art curated in the botanical gardens, sensitivity awakening surroundings that just affected that switch in my perception and added that incredibly fun layer to my life. So with this little anecdote and without any further ado, over to lovely Hannah. Welcome. Thank you, Candida. It's an absolute pleasure to be here moderating this panel for the Vov. I'm going to jump straight in with my first question, and that's to Emma. Emma, the Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh is not only a home to an incredible collection of Andy Goldsworthy, one of my absolute favorite artists of all time, but you also continuously look to create new art-centered programs and content. I'd love to ask you, Emma, as the head of creative programming in Edinburgh, to tell us a little bit about your internal thinking behind this and why your garden has particularly decided to focus on art, even as a form of interpretation. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, thank you, Candida. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here on Earth Day. Um, the, the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh has a, a commitment to addressing the biodiversity crisis and contributing solutions to climate emergency. And this commitment includes its diverse range of programs, its science and education, as well as towards direct engagement with the public. This takes the form, many forms for us, and that can be from urban gardening to skills training um, for community groups. Um, but it also includes the opportunity to explore science, conservation and ecology through its arts program and gallery space. Gallery space being Inverleith House, now Climate House. Here in Edinburgh, as a botanical garden, we have a long and unique history of working with art. And last year, thanks to the Outset Transformation, Transformation Award, saw us launch a new strategy, one that repositions our gallery in Belief House into Climate House, giving a platform for artists and audiences to connect with the climate emergency and biodiversity crisis. Creating a space for as many different voices as possible from our own science, horticulture, international collaborators to artists. We believe that artists can help us share hidden voices voices of those less heard, voices from the archives. And the images that we're sharing with you here are a beautiful example of that. They come from an exhibition at the end of last year that we were lucky enough to open to the public, Florilegium, A Gathering of Flowers. And they are by Barbadian artist, Anna Lee Davis, who lives and works on a dairy farm, which until 40 years ago had a long history back to 1667 as a sugar plantation. In this body of work, there are two kinds of family portrait, as well as six additional drawings on ledger paper. It's called As If the Entanglement of Our Lives Did Not Matter. And it's a very complex set of images. But in brief, these paintings are of a family group that couldn't come together because of the race laws at the time. They're surrounded with plants that have healing properties. There are plants for a broken heart, for wounds, for skin disorders. Um, and and Annalie has placed these images of plants and roots on ledger paper. And that ledger paper is, is referencing the kind of bookkeeping tool often um, that can be seen as symbolic of the British Empire and how it was used to measure and record. In, in, in this case, you can see that the work has been, in the cases in front of the work, you can see that it's been paired with herbarium specimens from, from our own collections. And this has helped us create a very charged weaving of the narratives and highlights for us the kind of fruitfulness that artistic collaborations and the ways in which art 
uh, art and plants can open up much wider conversations about the world at large. Um, so, so art plays a really important role for us in, in both in our exhibitions program and outside within the garden. Oh, thanks, Emma. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, Lucia, I'd love to bring you in here a second um, because you've been working really closely with Emma, uh, developing the program Back to Earth for the Serpentine Gallery as a celebration of both their 50 year anniversary and the Edinburgh Botanical Gardens 350th anniversary. It'd be wonderful to hear from you a bit about the thinking from the gallery perspective um, about why the collaboration with the Botanical Garden and why this partnership is so significant. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. And it's so wonderful to be here. So thank you, Candida and everyone at the VOB for bringing us all together. Um, so just from the point of view of a little bit of background before this collaboration came to flourish, my role at the Serpentine as Curator of General Ecology was to sort of nourish this program, General Ecology, which looked to influence and infect as a kind of prototype, an art organization with a kind of environmental mission or sense of purpose, or some kind of feeling of purpose around environmental justice and balance. And it was in that spirit and out of those kinds of long term weavings that we've been doing uh, over the last, I think, since 2018, that we grew, we planted, I suppose, the project Back to Earth uh, on the occasion of the Serpentine's 50th anniversary, now 50 plus one, because 2020 was really a kind of rehearsal for 2021, I think. Oh, well, let's hope not. But, uh, uh, and so, uh, and, and Back to Earth is this very strange uh, project that articulates itself in all kinds of forms and with all kinds of partners in order to support 65-ish artists. Um, you see here some snapshots from the General Ecology Project. 65-ish uh, artists, uh, artworks that are also at the same time an environmental campaign and initiative. So we're very adherent to the needs of each uh, campaign and initiative in order to be able to try and realize it to the best of its kind of potential from the point of view of impact. And it was in that spirit that when we, uh, that we uh, applied for Outset's transformative grant and this kind of genius idea that uh, was this matchmaking of Climate House and the Back to Earth and General Ecology Project at the Serpentine was, uh, was so, so per kind of pitch perfect to the intentions of the last few years of work. Not to mention the fact that without knowing it, I was already one of Emma's biggest fans because of Emma's longstanding work on the Isle of Skye um, with artists cooking sections with whom we're also working. And so, it sort of came to be at a moment in which uh, we had to look at all the initiatives and all the campaigns and figure out how to best support them. And so we looked through all of the different ideas and proposals and projects, and we identified those ones that particularly would benefit from being either cited in or uh, done with the help of the skills of botanical knowledge. So cited in botanical gardens or done with botanical expertise, or indeed uh, projects that address uh, forests uh, conservation of forest science in general. Um, and what we're trying, what we're beginning to do now is to really kind of develop closer collaborations between Emma and Climate House as the art branch and scientists of Art BGE and the Serpentine and the artists in order to flourish some of these campaigns and initiatives, hopefully also in, uh, I'm, I'm hoping between London, Scotland and the rest of the world actually, because because that's what they're hoping to do. But from the point of view of why gardens and why botany and art, I feel very passionate about this and don't have time to make a case for it that's compelling enough uh, today, but obviously we'll be happy to talk about it later, which is I'm completely convinced that there is a, um, a incredibly deep connection between art in a wide sense, so poetry, myth, abstraction of different forms, the forms that we've held as a human species since the beginning of time, and our knowledge around climate um, uh, and plants and agriculture and all of these things. Divinations were at the beginning always to do with the weather, right? And the weather always had to do with agriculture. So actually the relationship between art and plants predates maybe even our understanding of what of art in the first place. I mean, it definitely does. Uh, and so to return to those kinds of relationalities, also to be able to question certain forms of um, of botanical 
nomenclature and knowledge and classification, for example, to see it in the context of decolonial efforts and to see it in the context of, you know, what are all the various kinds of this fantastic chorus that holds so much knowledge of ways in which we've, as a human species, multiple and diverse as we are, have um, uh, learned and co-evolved with plants. I think that's, it's, it's kind of one of the things that I'm the most passionate about. So it was, this matchmaking was one of the most wonderful gifts. <laughs> Thank you, Lucia. Um, it's amazing to have the insight and hear um, a little bit from your perspective and your side. And I think we as botanical gardens can definitely come together with you in forming that, uh, that case that you're searching for. Um, we'll be all very happy to do that, I'm sure. Moving to Jennifer. Jennifer, in February, the Mary Selby Gardens in Florida opened your new exhibition, The Roy Lichtenstein, Monet's Garden Goes Pop. I love the title. Um, from what I understand, this is your fifth year that you've held a show, that you've held a show like this as part of your Jean and Alfred Goldstein exhibition series. Can you describe for us a little bit about the artwork or even one of the shows that resonated strongly amongst your visitors um, that explored the relationship between the location at the Botanical Garden and the work itself? I'd be delighted to. And I want to add my thanks. Thanks for having me join this group today. It's a privilege, really. Um, so just to back it up a little bit, I, I arrived at Marie Selby Botanical Gardens in Sarasota, Florida in 2015. And when I first arrived, people would say, oh, I love Selby Gardens, but as if they didn't have a reason to come back. And so it became crystal clear to me that we needed to have a schedule of rotating exhibitions, just like art museums do. And we actually trademarked the terminology, the living museum to describe our new operating model. So um, we now have rotating exhibits all year long. And Hannah, you mentioned the Jean and Alfred Goldstein exhibition series, which specifically connects art to nature and art in a garden setting. And so um, right now, we, we, as you mentioned, our fifth exhibit in the series is Roy Lichtenstein, Monet's Garden Goes Pop. And what we've been trying to do with this series is reveal the surprising connections of certain artists to nature, um, because almost every artist is inspired by nature. And I think people lose sight of that. And so so many people approached me about uh, doing an exhibit on Monet's garden. And of course I love Monet, um, but I felt that the subject matter had been studied so much. And uh, I was taking a look at uh, pop art icon, Roy Lichtenstein, and I wondered, huh, I wonder if Roy did anything connected to nature. And I came across the fact that he did his own take on Monet's water lilies and haystacks in his own pop art style. So we have a climate controlled gallery on our campus and we were able to secure the loans of these rarely seen artworks by Roy Lichtenstein reinterpreting Monet's iconic garden. And then our horticultural team set out to recompose our gardens and evoke the iconic gardens of Giverny but through the lens of Roy Lichtenstein's pop art. So, you know, the bold commercial colors, the black hard outlines, the flattened image, the two dimensions. And this is one of 10 outdoor vignettes that we have um, depicting the iconic home of Monet, which is a focal point of his gardens at Giverny, but done in Lichtenstein style. And we accomplished that pink color by using red printer's dots, the Bende dots. Um, and then you see the flattened image, the 2D, that wonderful blue green color of Monet's gardens at Giverny, that's so iconic, but again, done in this pop art style. And then you see the wonderful mixed borders and plantings that you would associate with Monet's garden. So this is like a wonderful mashup between 
Monet and Lichtenstein, and you would normally not associate impressionist masterworks with pop art. And what's been surprising about the show is how similar they are. Both believed in serial imagery, repeating the image, both artists, you really need to stand back to appreciate their artwork. In Monet's case, um, you know, he was all about the brush stroke and Lichtenstein really erased the brush stroke. And if you got close, you saw flat planes of color and step back and you would see the art. So throughout our 15 acre gardens, we have these vignettes that are an interpretation of the iconic elements of Monet's garden but done through Lichtenstein style. And it's been a tremendous amount of fun. And we've gotten a significant amount of attention because it's an interpretation that hasn't been done before. And we're really excited about this program going forward and continuing to examine artists through the lens of, of a botanical garden. Jennifer, you, um, you touched upon so many points in that that I can relate to here in Jerusalem and our garden, um, which I'm sure the other botanical gardens also, in just, you know, having visitors come to the garden, wanting them to have repeat visits, obviously throughout the seasons the gardens change, but also drawing their attentions to things that they wouldn't be looking at before and from a different lens. And art succeeded in doing that um, in such an incredible way that I think that, you know, us gardens opening up and really trying to use art in this way for a win-win uh, relationship is, is incredible. I'm going to ask you just one more question, which I didn't plan to ask you, but as you started speaking, I thought, as you, you know, you're making art so the core of what you're doing there and you're really, really rushing ahead with it. How do your internal team um, meaning your maintenance, your gardening stuff, your horticultural stuff. How do they all view uh, this central topic being art in the gardens? So that's a great question. And um, throughout the year, because we do changing exhibits, the other exhibits are, are much more core to what we are about as a garden. We're known for having the world's best scientifically documented collection of orchids, for example. So we have an annual orchid show. This series really pushes everyone out of the box. And I think our team is having a lot of fun with it. Um, and the way we operate is we work backwards from the art. So first we secured the loans of Roy Lichtenstein's water lilies and haystacks. And then our horticulture team examined those, studied the artist, studied Monet's garden and thought, well, how can we translate this to our gardens? And so I am very proud to say that our horticulture team came up with all of these designs internally and they're really just brilliant. And, you know, they're almost inventing a new medium. You have visual art, you have performing art, and now you have living art. And it's a new language that can really engage visitors and, and at the same time underscore the connections between art and nature and gardens. Thank you. I think if we have time later on after the questions and answers, I might throw that same question uh, to Michelle and Emma. Um, but first of all, Daisy, I'd before I say anything, congratulations, Daisy, uh, for winning the Eden Prize competition, uh, The Pollinator. Your work, you know, we were speaking before and your work sounds absolutely fascinating. Uh, so maybe you can share a little bit of that with us. Um, I know it's, it's some parts are secret, but what you can share with us would be absolutely wonderful. And maybe also focus a little bit on the relationship between uh, the research part of it, because I know you're, you're deeply into your research and I think it's super interesting um, to look at how artists conduct their research alongside how scientists would conduct their research. So maybe you can speak a little bit about the project and about your approach. Thank you. It's, yeah, I want to just echo it's so great to be here with so many people who are essentially on the other side of what I'm doing, who get tortured by people like me. So um, 
I won the commission to make a new piece for the Eden Project and it's part of a larger program of work about bringing awareness to the decline of pollinators around the world. So the numbers have dropped by 25% in the last 30 years. And that work is funded by the Garfield Weston Foundation. And I was asked to make a proposal about pollinators for an outdoor sculpture and it's a 52 meter plot. And I thought, well, why am I making a piece about pollinators? Let's make a piece for pollinators. And it also came from, you know, I've been exhibiting a lot um, in gallery spaces and museums and learning about making digital artworks that have to be plugged in and getting increasingly worried about the, the environmental footprint of actually shipping work. So I thought here's an opportunity to make a digital artwork but that we fabricate in flowers locally. So those were the starting points and then sort of researching how pollinators see differently to us, they see different colours, they perceive depth differently and so then I decided well why don't we make a garden designed by an algorithm that optimises the planting for pollinators not for human aesthetics and how would we feel about a garden that's not designed for us but designed for other species as the main audience. So it's an artwork for pollinators. Um, that turns out to be really difficult. <laughs> but part of why I was so excited to work with Eden was the opportunity to work with our horticulturalists. And, and that really motivated my, my proposal as well. Um, I like torturing experts with questions. And um, this is just a collective piece of the endeavor, I think I should say, because first of all, we develop a plant palette and we're working on the first one, which is the UK plant palette. And every plant is researched to be verified as good for pollinators. And so many of the things we might have in our gardens, we think are beautiful, but may have been bred to not actually optimize for pollinators. So they may smell better or have more petals and be more beautiful. So we create this list that we know is good for pollinators. And then the algorithm um, starts to optimize, to be maximized blooming over the year. We maximize the diversity of pollinators, balancing out who gets served and then arrange the plants in a way that um, caters for the different flight patterns of different pollinators. And then because it was lockdown when I proposed this last year, I couldn't even buy seeds because it was the garden centers were shut. I thought, well, why don't, you know, we can't travel, but data can travel, seeds can travel, and pollinators can travel. So why can't we put this online and actually create a website where anyone can use the same algorithm? And what I want to do with this experiment is actually create um, a different kind, a more altruistic model for an artwork. Um, so we're working with Google Arts and Culture and the Gaia Art Foundation now to make this interactive website where people can design their own garden using the same tool um, and then plant it if they have space or if they can find a community space. And then the idea is to commission more of these gardens in other countries and through that model create new regional plant lists that then are donated back to the website. So seeding more artworks for pollinators in each location. Um, and so just creating this collaborative network in a, in a different model, perhaps to the way we normally see art in a museum where it's commissioned by a museum and it's the first showing. Instead, we're doing this whole thing as a collective effort to uh, try and make space for pollinators and allow people to think about um, the world from the perspective of pollinators and plants and their interactions. So it's crazy. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea last year and it, it's um, just phenomenal the amount of research and experts that we get to talk to everyone from people who study the, the ways that pollinators see or fly um, to the Eden's amazing horticultural team. Wow. <laughs> I'm blown away. Um, you know, it's also interesting to hear about it from the research perspective because so many horticulturalists and scientists are working, you know, following pollinators and studying them to be able to, to do that from an artist's perspective and present that in such an interesting and accessible way um, is is mind blowing. So we can all, I'm sure, understand why the judges chose this. Uh, it will be launching in September. So everyone, hopefully the proof will be in the pudding when you play with it on the website. So, well, there's um, this. There's also the research part, which you, you know, which you've done up until now. So I believe the proof is already there uh, to some extent. Well done. Um, 
Michelle, I'm going to move on to you. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as the executive director of Tucson Botanical Garden, you yourself, and I know this firsthand, are uh, extremely driven into pushing a rich art-centered agenda there. In your opinion, how has art been used to communicate or educate issues surrounding climate change, biodiversity, or food security? I know we heard a little bit from uh, Daisy just now on how that's possible. Um, I'd love to hear again from the garden perspective, just either an example or something you've seen or shown at the gardens where you feel this, these messaging have really had a strong impact. Well, it's interesting because when I was asked to think about that, I thought it's almost like, how do you pick between your favorite child? Every exhibit brought something completely unique and spoke to people in a completely different way. You know, our story is similar to Jennifer's in that in 2015, we began the model of bringing in rotating exhibits and it was just transformative, not only for our garden, but for the public people who had never been to the garden, who had never been to a garden came. And it was so impactful that three years ago, our board of directors decided to change our entire mission statement which was really focused on living appropriately in a desert environment. It was very long, I could never remember it. Um, and today it really reflects our purpose, which is to connect people with plants and nature through art, through history, through science and through culture. You know, we're not a research garden, we're a small midtown Tucson in the city garden filled with 17 pocket gardens. So we were formed by a family who were naturalists and the wife was an artist. So um, when we think of how to get those messages about climate change and biodiversity and all those really important topics, the, the reality is, is that sometimes those are words, they're very abstract to the general population. And we believe that people love and protect things um, that they grow to love and that they understand. And doing that by blending art and gardens, you know, we have found that we can turn those non-naturalists into nature appreciators because they will come once for the um, exhibit, but we have found that they come four to five times after that to see the exhibit. Oh, but to discover the pollinator garden. And we want to do that in our backyard. And oh, I didn't know you could grow herbs in Tucson. And what kind of organics do you use? I mean, it just opens up a, a, a bevy of questions and, and inspiration. Um, you know, the, the pandemic right now has also really highlighted that gardens and nature are more important than ever. And through this, I think we've worked so hard with this mission and with connecting people through art to nature, the letters we've received have been um, astounding. Uh, people saying, I cannot imagine my life without the ability to go to the garden. To, without, when are you bringing back an exhibit? It's been really transformative. I think taking these spaces and bringing art into them really completes that immersive experience and when you do that, you're teaching people to love and to appreciate and to care about the things that are important on this earth. Michelle, you led so perfectly into my next question. Um, but first I wanna ask you, did I, did I hear you say at the beginning that your founders of Tucson Botanical Garden was, um, were, was married to an artist? Yes, the, the founder was a nursery manager. He was he started the first nursery and his wife was a naturalist and an artist. And um, I have Mrs. Porter, our founder's journals um, and drawings and wow. she the space becoming a botanical garden. So it, you know, so often gardens are stories about people as much as they are about the plants. So it just, it's just a, a, a beautiful symphony. So the marriage between uh, botanical gardens and art was there from your birth there in Tucson. So that's, that's a really nice story. Um, so it leads perfectly, as I said, into the next question, which is for all of you. So I'll ask you each individually, but I'll, I'll just ask now. Um, what do you think are the most important ways in which an artist and a botanical garden can work together to create the most thoughtful, authentic meeting point? especially 
in the change and the face of the global pandemic? Uh, and this is a question really directly related to our communities and those serving the, those we're serving. Um, so I'll start with you, Jennifer. So, um, you know, I think there's there's a whole new space for artists to think about botanical gardens. Uh, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the idea of the living museum and what that means. And I think for artists today, um, you know, they can think outside of the traditional gallery setting and look to botanical gardens and nature as um, you know, the venue for showcasing their artwork. I think you know the pandemic certainly underscored the importance of um, these outdoor green spaces. And I think um, for the botanical gardens that have already started to do um, art exhibits in the gardens, it just shows that this is the a, a terrifically open new platform that artists should absolutely be looking to as another vehicle to, to uh, get their artwork out to the public, for sure. Daisy, I might, I might go to you now for an artist opinion. Um, well, I think, I mean, so much of the work I've done previously has been looking at colonialism, uh, scientific methods, the the kind of control of nature and what really, and now I've sort of collaborated with gardens and um, different herbariums and so on. And I think what really inspired me about Eden's mission was this five part thing of creating a sense of um, connection or in jeopardy, and then also instilling hope and agency in the audience. And that really also inspired the work and for me was helping me deal with a, a crisis that, that I was facing. I'm making these pieces about loss and extinction. And what am I asking people to do? And I was also inspired by what the Serpentine have been doing with Back to Earth with this idea of the campaign. And in a way, what we're doing is now become an art led campaign rather than a particular garden or project. And so for me, it's, it's challenged the way I work and helped me think about how I deal with my own sense of panic. Um, to give an audience agency. What we're doing won't solve the crisis, but it allows people to learn and actually feel active and, and using the value of art to create a sense of um, excitement. You know, you can have your own edition if you, if you take the time to plant it and, and invest the money in flowers. So Definitely. Thank you, Daisy. I'm going to ask you, Emma. I know we're not going to have time to ask everybody because we want to get to the questions and answers as well. Um, but I'll ask you, Emma, to maybe talk a little bit about the global pandemic and how you think it's important for us to address this. You're on mute. <laughs> um, building on, on what the others were saying, you can see behind me our gallery sitting in this constellation of plants. And it, and it is a stage set um, in many ways for the art that exists within the garden. But for us, um, we have this huge kind of scientific wing and research wing of, of work, working with 55 countries around the globe. Um, and so uh, many people who visit the garden often uh, I think see it as a park and, and part of my mission is to communicate the kind of valuable science that's going on as well and, uh, and that kind of call to action that um, we're witnessing. Um, and I think the, the pandemic has certainly brought that into sharp focus and, and whilst our gallery was closed we actually had an artwork clinging on to the side of of Inverleith House. Um, it's still there at the moment by um, Lisa Rowett. It's a, it's a giant golden monkey and it talks to the plants that are planted around Inverleith House and, and also um, it, you know it's a, a charismatic animal that talks about the, the plight that it's facing in the, in the Himalayan region in China. So um, uh, it's, it's caused uh, 
well, it's it's been a delight, if you like, to to witness people experiencing that in the garden. It's both been um, appealing and Instagrammable, Instagrammable, but it's also been a kind of sobering moment to reflect um, upon where we are at the moment with the climate crisis. Yeah, I, I can totally relate to that and say here from the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens, in between the lockdowns, we were one of the places that were actually allowed to be open, being a large open space. And we found ourselves with people just coming in desperate to, to actually go somewhere um, and to, you know, to experience nature, but also craving culture. Uh, when With all the galleries and museums closed, People just wanted to see something, they wanted to experience something that took them away from the reality of everyday life and made them think and have something to talk about that wasn't the global pandemic. Uh, so we realized ourselves, as, as I see all of you did, um, that there was space for us also to step up what we were already doing um, and really address this and give our community something during this time. And I, I don't see this ever going back. You know, we hope we're going to get out of this pandemic. Uh, but there's there's so much more that we can all do. And now we've we've started uh, down this really exciting road and this partnership with with the art industry uh, in a different way. So it's really exciting. I'm going to um, move on to the questions and answers in one minute. Uh, I'm just going to ask one last question. So if you've got questions and answers please write them in the questions and answers. I don't promise that we'll get to all of them, uh, but I can see some, some people have, so I'm gonna start asking them in just a moment. I'd just like to ask you, Lucia, before going to the question and answers, how do you think other sectors may follow in these creative in, interdisciplinary opportunities? Uh, do, we, do we already see them occur in other disciplines and sectors, and how can we inspire them to do this? I think we definitely see them occur and we see them occur in place in, in scenarios and situations in which there's a few maybe individuals who are really committed to their discipline, but sometimes but have a kind of general curiosity about others. And in those places, then art tends to be a really great catalyst and kind of ga convener really of, of, of the dis different disciplines and sometimes also translator. And I was thinking about that in relation to your previous question, actually, um, and thinking about how um, one of the important kind of tasks in, in, for us in the, on the art end is to present the different ways in which art can be involved with other disciplines towards environmental justice and balance. Because I think a lot of the times uh, the perception that our collaborators have of what art can do best is to make kind of complex data or abstract data enfleshed and, and powerful. And we know that that is true and we absolutely are dedicated to making that happen. But we also know that both gardens and art can be therapeutic. We also know that both gardens and art can be um, a for, a forms of resistance or of political organization. We also know that art is a place in which prototypes, I mean, Daisy's is a, yours is a great example, prototypes that perhaps don't have to have an immediate output in the way that a scientific piece of research that is purely in that field needs to have. And so there's a kind of freedom, freedom to succeed, freedom to try, freedom to fail, and freedom to collaborate with other disciplines that I think it's really important. And then finally, it does this fantastic job at um, sort of feeding active, hopeful, speculative, future options. And I think, you know, in a situation that is so dreadful in relation to the climate crisis, giving up <laughs> nihilism and giving up is kind of the worst thing we can do. So this active hope in the words of the great Joanna Macy is kind of, is how we keep, I'm sure that we all, given that we're so close to the subject, have to wake ourselves up and look in the mirror and go, okay, active hope today, yes. <laughs> you know, Thank keep trying. You so trying. Much. Lucia, thank you so much. We're going to go on to the uh, questions and answers. Um, I have a really beautiful question here, which is um, not so much around art, uh, but definitely touching upon a lot of what we've discussed today. So it's for everybody, which is, do you feel yourself, you have a spiritual connection with the plants and the, and the, um, the flora 
in the gardens. So I'm going to actually start now with Michelle. I'm going to ask for very short answers so we can address a few questions before the end. Uh, absolutely. It came, to, it came to light in the pandemic when we were closed for three months and I would walk through the garden and I saw that the plants took over, the plants and the birds took over. And I felt that it, it really spoke to me that the plants yet were beckoning to be touched and to be smelled. Um, it was really quite emotional at that time. Thank you. I'm going to ask that same question uh, onto Emma. I, I can completely concur. I mean, our audiences haven't, our visitors haven't been in our glass houses for over a year now, and they are extraordinary you know the their um the plants have kind of taken over and um just being in them is uh, you you have that kind of spiritual connection and uh, our head of horticulture um is known for his tree hugging so um <laughs> okay <laughs> more questions about that later emma <laughs> So the next question coming in, which is a really nice one also, uh, asks, when you take an object, so we're talking about work that wasn't site specifically created for a natural environment or the gardens. When you take an object from a museum or a gallery space and you place it inside the gardens, what kind of changes do occur? Uh, what do you notice changes in your experience and how does the viewer experience that work differently? I'm going to go to you, uh, Jennifer, with that. So I think the whole idea of putting art in a garden setting or, or natural setting puts all of the emphasis on the nature in the artwork. So to give you my, 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 one of my best examples, we collaborated with the Israel Museum on our first exhibit in this series featuring Marc Chagall. And Marc Chagall had been studied, of course, many, many times, but never in the context of his connection to flowers and nature. And when you look through the body of his entire work, the flowers are always there. You know, they really represented the joy in life amidst all the sorrow and struggles. And so I think the lens of a botanical garden creates an entirely different way of looking at art. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm going to ask you, um, Emma, to also answer that question. Well, I would completely back up Jennifer's view. I mean, we have a a unique context in which to to view art and um, and for art to engage people in uh, with nature. That that's um, that's absolutely uh, paramount for us, and and you really see that. And you're talking about the the Andy Goldsworthies that we have. I mean, he's a, a fine example um, of of how people become engaged with nature through art. Lucia, um, there's a question for you here that's come up. How has the art world adopted an emerging focus on environmental environmentalism in all sectors? I'm just reading the question again to understand it. How, do, how has the art world adapted to an emergent focus on environmentalism in all sectors? Is it, is it doing enough? Well, that's uh, the second part is the harder and probably uh, more fun one to answer. I think uh, one of the great things that have happened over the last few years in the art field has been a recognition, has been a recognition of the fact that we are all implicated in this mess. And that as a result, that fear of not wanting to raise it as a subject matter, lest we be asked what our own carbon footprint might be, has kind of dispelled. And we're all being able to have a conversation that just says, you know what, we're all in this, we're all implicated. So let's start. Now, from the point of view of the General Ecology Project, that happened in this simultaneous making programs around the environment, mobilizing a community of audience members around that, and then mirroring back to the institution a commitment that they ha have somehow already made. 
and therefore kind of encouraging that commitment to go a little bit deeper. And I think that work between subject and system is always really important to do the two at the time because eventually you just kind of sandwich the whole of the artwork. <laughs> Definitely. Daisy, um, I'd love to hear your opinion on this as well. So I also need sunglasses here. Um, uh, I think uh, I'd like to answer it differently. I think when I've been in some of these recent exhibitions, you know, there does seem to be a lot more focus. One concern is, will it go out of fashion? And the other concern is, um, are we being asked for solutions? And I may be more sensitive to that because I come from a design background and architecture background originally. But is it, um, it's more what are we doing it for? And I, and I think that's my, you know, I'm trying to ask myself that in this, in this particular work that I'm working on now. Um, because I made a piece about a rhino, am, am I asking people just to feel sad? Or am I asking them to donate money to save the rhino? Or, or what is the commitment we're actually asking for? And is it the role of art to do that? And that's why I'm kind of spinning in circles as well. And so I'm finding a different way of addressing that for myself. But I would say it's not doing enough because everyone, we need to do it in all the different ways that we act as citizens, as people in the arts, as, as um, people who buy stuff. You know, it's every, every single way that we can work. So let's, let's draw from what you just said about the call for action side. Is it the responsibility of an artist? Is it the responsibility of a botanical garden? Um, is it about the responsibility? We only have time now for that one question uh, to discuss a little bit about the responsibility and is that something we're willing to take on? Um, I'm gonna ask Michelle. Yes, I absolutely believe. I mean, we all have that responsibility and, and by working through these unique creative ways, you know, everyone has a different method of learning and taking in information and what evokes that emotion in you. And, and it is our responsibility to find those connectors in any way possible through plants, through nature, through arts. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass back to Candida. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Hannah, for doing a stellar job in leading this fascinating conversation. And to all the participants, it was a real enlightenment and really fantastic to hear from all of you. And so many aspects that were so interesting. Um, I'd love to invite you all to continue the conversation um, on social and um, so log on and continue. I also would love to invite you to all plant a garden as soon as Alexandra is making sort of the algorithm available to us and I'm going to be the first one to to do that on my balcony. Um, and really thank you all of uh, the participants and the audiences for joining us today as we mark the launch of the Vov Unites event series. Um, please sign up to our website, stay up to date with our exhibitions, events, because there's so much more to come from lunchtime tours with gallery directors and curators to interactive workshops with artists, including the first ever live drawing class of a digital avatar. So I'm really excited to participate in that one. Um, next week on The Volve, we have a lunchtime tour of the Tate's exhibition, Art Now, Lisa Bryce a fascinating dive into the world of NFTs with renowned artist John Gerard, and a tour of the drawing room's Mark Bauer, Malaitre performance with Mark Bauer himself. You can find all the information on how to sign up on our website and in our weekly newsletter. And you've, if you've enjoyed this, please donate because we all want to continue this wonderful work and support our wonderful institutions and artists. So thanks again for joining us today and see you again very soon on The Volve. Bye for now. <laughs>